Make up your mind, Kane. Are you trying to be my boss? Or are you my son? And now that I know the truth, I own you! So the conversation that Brett Mahoney had was he was having people challenge Kane more, make him more human and not a cartoon character, and I think they really did a great job at that. Those were the words of Woody McLean who plays Kane prior to season 3, and I think we're beginning to see those words come to fruition. Kane Tejada definitely isn't a cartoon character anymore, not to say he doesn't provide great comedic value, because the dynamic between him and Brayden really does work well. I do this, you coming with me. Yeah, nah, I don't think that's such a good Yeah, nah, I don't think that's a great idea. Silver fucking spoon. But Kane is beginning to show he's a lot more smarter and a lot more strategic compared to both seasons 1 and 2, where he did show glimpses of what he was capable of. I once said during season 2, if Kane was able to control his anger and not make emotional based decisions, we really would have a dangerous character on our hands. No doubt, being under the guidance of Mecha for a season definitely helped him to grow as a person and develop similar traits that Mecha once had. So in the rest of this video, we're going to be breaking down how Kane uncovered the Lorenzo truth by just taking a step back and thinking before he acts. A stark contrast to where he used to shoot first, think later in season 1. We're going to look at his relationship with Tariq, Brayden and Effie, but also how him taking charge of the Tahada organization will eventually end up with him being humbled in Power Book 2 Ghost Season 3. Now when we were introduced to Kane in Season 1, he was certainly a character who used to act first, think later. We then saw him make decisions without necessarily thinking about the consequences. And we also saw how that came back to bite the Tahadas when Zeke got roped up for Ramirez and Jabari's murder. But before we come to the events that unfolded for Kane in Season 3, I do think it's worth revisiting a few conversations from Season 2. What am I to you? Huh? Your soldier or your fucking son? You're both. Then what kind of fucking mother does that make you? Now the relationship that we see Monet and Lorenzo have with Kane and their kids is completely different to the relationship that we once saw Tasha and Ghost have with Tariq, which really is an important point I think we need to make. On one hand, we had parents who lied to their son to protect him from the vicious cycles of the street game, but on the other hand, when we were first introduced to the Tahadas, they were parents who were honest about who they were and they created this entire drug organisation around putting their kids in different positions. But am I your son or your soldier? And I think that's a fine line that Kane has been towing since season 1. Kane is definitely Monet's son, but she's also made no secret about how she's willing to sacrifice Kane for the greater good. But this is the streets. You gotta protect yourself at all times by any means necessary. So if he comes to you, it is what it is. Another example being when Zeke got roped up for Ramirez's death. She was ready to sacrifice Kane for Zeke, because Zeke wasn't just her eldest son, he was a way out of the game, whereas all Kane seemed to do was create problems. Ever since this moment where Lorenzo had him be in prison, I think Kane's held a little grudge against his father, and he's definitely wanted to get one upon Lorenzo ever since. Kane wanted to be a key decision maker for the Tejado organization from season 1, but he was always told to fall back and treated more like a soldier than a son, both by Monet and Lorenzo. Now we certainly can't blame him for wanting to claim the Tejada throne, but what we could question before was his impulsive decision making, which led to countless of problems for him and his family, problems which you can't always solve with a gun. Now, his powdered sugar move was a clear indication that Kane was beginning to think three moves ahead, even though at first he found himself on the outs with the Tejada family and organisation in season 2, he knew they couldn't live without a supplier. That was the one key lesson Mecha taught Kane. Without supply, nobody's getting high, and that's why he remained key, he was the plug. Now fast forward to when Lorenzo was released from prison, Kane was the one who found himself in control, but in this situation, Lorenzo was definitely right. It was about to go tits up and Kane was acting too big for his boots. But that is something that has started to change in Go Season 3. So we pick up with Kane's story arc 3 months after the events that unfolded at the end of Season 2. Now in these 3 months, the Tahadas haven't exactly been doing nothing because they did have some product left over that they stole from Mecca. But the dynamics in the Tahada household has completely changed from previous seasons. Monet wants out the game. She's giving Drew and Kane this freedom to live in Mecca's penthouse, and Diane has moved to Stansfield. But one thing that remained the same in episode 1 was Lorenzo calling the shots. Well, at least trying to call the shots, because that did quickly change. Now, we can't continue without giving credit to Mecca for helping Kane with his transformation, because the Kane we're now seeing in season 3 is built different. He started to use his head a lot more, and he's thinking outside the box by connecting the dots. On the other hand, Lorenzo has been in complete panic mode ever since he killed Zeke. Just think about this desperate move that Lorenzo made in episode 2 by having his own son Drew beat up to cover his tracks. 
He said that whoever attacked Drew was the same man that killed Zeke, but Lorenzo was the one who was behind the GTG attack. But Kane wasn't buying that shit, and he was right. But his biggest mistake was telling Kane to go and find the killer of Zeke. Why or why would Lorenzo ask Kane to go and find the killer? This is the difference between him and Kane this season. Kane's not taking everything at face value. He's thinking, okay, something doesn't add up here, and it all started with Mecha's pilots. Although we're seeing Kane change in terms of he's thinking a bit more. One thing that will never change is his love for torture and a good fist fight. Now, he first got the description of the killer from the pilot, as well as finding out he had a broken taillight. He then found Zeke's championship ring on the GTG member, which connected all the dots for Kane. So this is why he looked in the direction of Lorenzo. While Monet pulled the trigger and killed the GTG member, is because he knew Lorenzo should have been on the other side of that gun, and so it was time for Kane to use this as leverage. Now, many may question why did Kane use this as leverage over Lorenzo to own him, and considering he's his father, but this is why I set the foundation of going through Kane's story arc. They treat Kane as more of a soldier than their son. For example, the prison beatdown. So why would Kane treat Lorenzo any different? So this is where we saw Kane using another key lesson that Mecha taught him in Season 2, Law 33 from the 48 Laws of Power. Discover each man's thumb screw, because everybody has a weakness, a hole in their armor, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a relationship like he's been using with Effie and how he did with Brayden and Tariq St. Patrick in Season 2, something I'm going to come to later on. Now, Thumbscrew can also be a secret. For example, Lorenzo killing Zeke, and now it's Kane who finds himself in control. Now, one thing we've become accustomed to with the Tahardas is that they're all out for themselves and always doing what's best for themselves. You rarely see them working as a collective, and this is why the family is completely disjointed. Monet wants out the game. Kane wants to be the leader of the Tahada organization, whereas Lorenzo wants Drew to be the leader. But Drew himself, he wanted to live a normal life, and he was kind of hovering in the middle. But where we may see a slight change after the latest events, but hold on to that thought, I'm gonna come back to Drew in just a moment. So it was intriguing to see how Kane used the secret to gain leverage and tell him he owns Lorenzo. It was a complete contrast to how Diana blew up the secret she had in season 2. She did it in front of the whole family, while Kane, he was clever in going directly at Lorenzo to get what he's always wanted, and now he owns his father. Now on Drew, we really did see a game-changing moment that can't be overlooked. Him and Ev are finished, but this ignited some fire in Drew. He's not one to deal with a heartbreak by moping around. He got shit done. He brutally murdered Nick and helped Brayden and Tariq take out their competition in Wall Street. But with Drew's character taking a turn and with Ev no longer in the picture, what's left for him? The game, something that has always been his destiny, but standing in his way of leading the Tohada organization is now Kane. So at some point, I really do expect the brothers to butt heads and clash. Woody also mentioned in an interview that at some stage, he will be humbled, and we haven't seen him be humbled just yet, so I do think that's something to bear in mind. Now, one thing I think which is a treat to watch is Kane, Brayden, Tariq St. Patrick all on one side, even if it may only be for a short term. We all know how Kane loves to clown Brayden and Tariq as Bonnie and Clyde, but when Brayden messaged him, he turned up. But more importantly, when they walked into the room after Tariq killed Bash in episode 1, Kane didn't turn around and say that sounds like a you problem like he would have done in season 1 or 2. He's a lot more smarter this season, and he knows they're all in this together. He's made sure nobody's looking for him, and he's also helped deal with the body pretty much straight away. So the dynamic and the team of Brayden, Kane, and Tariq St. Patrick will definitely be a treat to watch in season 3. But let's not forget, Kane is a character who does love a bit of chaos, because chaos creates opportunities. For example, just like how he's trying to work Effie. This look that Kane gave to Effie in Season 2 should have told us everything we needed to know. He definitely has taken a shine to Effie, and he loves poking Tariq by bringing her up at any chance he can get. But he's also playing both sides. He approached Effie and told her her man's Tariq was keeping her out the game. And I think we all know what game Kane is playing. He wants in. And at some point, we will see them doing some backhanded shit. So Kane and Effie's relationship is definitely one to keep an eye on. It may not be one that becomes romantic, but I'm thinking more business and get shit done because they were on the same page when it came to Lauren. But that's a deeper analysis of Kane to Harder and how he's got to where he's got to. It's not by accident, and he's certainly not a clown anymore, but also why it's not a full-gone conclusion that he'll be leading the Tohada organization in the long term. Drew may definitely have something to say about that, so drop all your thoughts on Kane's latest chess moves and his relationship with Tariq St. Patrick, Brayden, and Effie. But as always, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.